uh, I will briefly introduce Leonard. In fact, I know Leonard since 2005, I guess. Huh? And uh -huh. We were for a few months together in Ikrizat in, in Niger. So Leonard is a uh, hydrology uh, engineer, I guess. Mm -hmm. You're an engineer. Like yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, he's been joined, he joined CIMIT about a year ago in February uh, 2017. Uh, thanks to, uh, to uh, GIZ, he's uh, a SIM expert that's, uh, uh, you know, significantly funded by, uh, by the Germans. And uh, he's been joining the, the system intensification program uh, as a scaling specialist. And I think he was already a speci specialist, I think, in, in development, but I think it's becoming a real spe specialist in scaling now. Lennart is leading uh, the cluster of activity uh, on scaling for flagship four, the sustainable intensification flagship for both uh, maize and, and wheat. So, Leonard, the floor is yours. I'm sure that your presentation will generate a lot of questions and comments. Okay, thank you very much, Bruno, and thank you for not embarrassing me with some details from our time in Niger. So, thank you for that. Um, yes, I would like to talk about scaling of, of agricultural innovations and give you a little bit of an insight of, of what I've been seeing and doing and, and learning in the last year. I've been here a year now. And it's a process, so I'm still uh, learning every day uh, through discussions with people. Yesterday we had a very interesting session with Joachim, and you learn again with Carolina. And Maria, you go into the field, so every day you learn. So maybe next year the, the presentation will look very different. But this is just a, a snapshot of, of uh, maybe of, of today, right? And I want to start with this one. And I want to ask you, do you know what this number means? What is behind this number? It's not your bank account. <laughs> Does anybody know? Going in the direction. This is the target that the CGIR set by 2022, the amount of people that should have adopted uh, improved varieties or improved practices, right? I want to talk about some trends in the environment that we are working in. First of all, there's a growing need to show the impact of what we're doing, the effective effectiveness of what we're doing because we're using a lot of public resources as well to poverty and uh, ending hunger, right? Now, for example, this guy, he cut one third of the budget because he said, you know, I see poor and hungry people every day on TV. Whatever I invested so far didn't do anything, right? Another thing which is going on, there are many, many more diverse kind of donors. Maybe 20 years ago it was USAID, maybe GIZ. Now you have foundations, the MacArthur Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates, different kind of donors that are also competing for a place in the market. They want to be different. They want to do other things. And mostly they're focusing on impact per person, for example. What you also see is that in the countries that we are working, they're less aid dependent. So they have an own infrastructure. You have to listen to them as well. You cannot come in and say, okay, now we're going to do this and this is your education system. This is not possible anymore. Let me get rid of this picture because people are stopping eating now. Huh? <laughs> so what have, what have we been doing always? We said, you know, we do discovery. For example, we develop a seed here. We go to the proof of concept. We, we plant it here in our CIMIT uh, fence and people come and visit us. And then we pilot it, you know, outside in the field and everybody has this nice, fantastic variety. And the next step, because this is so fantastic, we go and scale this, you know, and it will be everywhere. And the different steps, this is what is used by GIZ at the moment, but I think it originally comes from the CGIR. And every time you have, let's say, a number of beneficiaries which are different, the partnerships are from, from academic to very much in the development uh, sphere. So there's changes. But what is actually, uh, has happened, this step has been a very big black box. And we've not been very successful in this. Not only us, but actually every actor in development. This is the key. So that's why some people say, pilots never fail, pilots never scale. And I just wanted to put it there because it rhymes nicely. But uh, these, are, these are people, a lot of people are, are criticizing us and other development uh, agencies for saying, yeah, well, you never get there, right? And I think one of the reasons is that the project that we are doing, or we call them pilot projects, 
they are very much in controlled environments, right? We have strong leadership. We get external experts to come in and manage a project. Maybe five people, very high, highly paid, very good people. They set up a system often parallel to the existing system, right? There's heavy support for partnerships. Partnerships are put in brackets because often we pay them to be our partner. You know, why don't you do this? And, and you know, we want to achieve this. We give you money so that you can do this. It's more like a service provider, right? Same for value chain actors. We give them money to develop a technology with and for us. We do a lot of capacity strengthening and we rely on unsustainable grants over a fixed start and end date. So to me, this is a very controlled environment. And this is a bit of a, I'm polarizing here a little bit just to make the message clear, right? Well, with the scaling, well, one of the, one of the definitions, I think, which, uh, yeah, which maybe I like the most up to a few weeks ago, is the scaling is the process of expanding beneficial technologies and practices over geographies, but also across institutions and, and levels to impact large number of people, right? And there are many different uh, definitions, but what keeps coming back is impact for many people, keyword on sustainability, and recently also very strong system change. Now I want to go through all these three elements, just give some examples of what I think is a project mindset and what is a scaling mindset. Okay? The project mindset, I need to reach all. This is the easy one. The scaling mindset, you don't need to reach all. You collaborate with those that share the same vision for change. So you're going to work with these guys and maybe you touch only a few of them, but you make sure that they are reaching them. You may be reaching a subset of them, right? The thing is, what, what, how does it change? Before our targets were like, we're saying, we are going to the farmer or the target is our farmer. But in this mindset, scaling mindset, these guys are our target. The financial service providers, maybe the banks, the market, market players or marketing experts, other projects. It also means something for the relation between direct and indirect beneficiaries. We've always in the project, we've always been focusing on the direct beneficiaries. I said, yeah, maybe they're also indirect. But in the scaling, maybe the, the indirect beneficiaries are maybe more important. Now, there's one, I just make one uh, sidestep because we always have this discussion, what is many? And I uh, don't have an answer there, but I just have an idea, which I'm going to share now, which is experimental, but it seems that you're allowed to experiment, right? So I would say, what is many? It's enough to provoke the system change that we're looking for. If you look into this com commercial literature or people that are in commerce to say, if you want to scale a project, you need to reach about 15 to 30% of the market and then you get a tipping point from where it will spread itself, right? This is a very like commercial marketing pathway and this is like the old figure of Rogers, which you've probably all seen, right? Now this is nice, but of course for us, it depends on the innovation. Can you imagine a hybrid seed versus a practice that can be easily copied, you know? You cannot just copy a hybrid seed. So this is already two different kind of innovations where the, the graph might be very, very different. We have different environments. Compare Ethiopia with, with Mexico, for example. Another very important question, which is becoming more and more important, and I think too long, the discussion on scaling has been around this quantitative element of it. Is success quantitative? What are the qualitative elements of success in this, of this, uh, in this case? What about sustainability? What about uh, real change? What about improved uh, lively, livelihoods, etc.? So the other question is, is not the impact, are we not scaling the impact rather than the number. And impact is a function of the number of people that have a benefit, right? So question marks here, okay? Let's go back to the other part. So sustainability, the project mindset, the reward for a successful project is doing another project. I see people smiling. I think people recognize it a little bit. I, or me too, okay? 
we're in, in, in doing that, we're maintaining and trying hard to maintain this controlled environment where we know exactly what is going on, right? And the question that we asked, what is the next project? Now, if we go and graduate into a scaling mindset, we are saying pilots are actually for testing concepts. We're testing something. They're not the solutions, right? It's just there and there it works or not, does not work, right? Individual projects are building blocks to achieve impact. So you would build on a project, project, and, and impact is maybe 10, 15 years or even longer sometimes. So there are a few ways to look at it. And I think coming from uh, our project culture, we often start here and say, yeah, um, we make things go to scale. We control the scaling process, right? But you could also help the scaling process, catalyze scaling, and you could also see things go to scale, create the conditions for scaling. And I think we should go a little bit more from here to here, because I think that in terms of sustainability, this is probably more sustainable than this, right, if, you, if we stay here. So the question would be, you know, what is next to support scaling instead of what is the next project, right? So what do you need, really need to do to support this scaling? Another thing which uh, you see very often, scaling is a bigger project, you know? You do the same with, with more money. And basically maybe this is your project, and then we do scaling and we just make more of them, rather than going out into the real world and try to, to work there, okay? Now, in, in, the, in scaling, we would say, okay, this may be doing more of the same. It's only one part of scaling. You have the scaling out, doing more of the same. But at least as important is the scaling up, this institutional change, the laws and governments. And together with Geraldo, we are making this poster. It's uh, almost ready. And uh, uh, basically, the, the volume here represents the kind of impact that we're having. And if you, keep, if you build only to the sides, you get a very flat and, and little volume in your pyramid, right? But if you then go a step up, you can easily build a much stronger case. Now, the third dimension, uh, which is often included in scaling up, but I think for us is very relevant, is the scaling deep. For me, this is like the, the, the volume or the third dimension of it to make it stable. And this is changing the hearts and minds of the people that we work with, because we are not working in, in uh, Belgium or in the Netherlands, there are issues there we need to change people's, or understand their cultures and maybe change it in, in some ways to make sure that they adopt whatever uh, they could adopt, right? Another one, yeah? Last example. Uh, project mindset, I contribute directly to a development outcome. I do my fertil integrated fertilizer. And what we say in a scaling, we would say, okay, I, I contribute indirectly to this development outcome, these big overarching outcomes. And we say, we are one part. If you want to solve this, or solve, let's say, uh, solve this, what, are, what, what do you need to solve this? Well, maybe you need, uh, everybody needs to have land rights, there needs to be a market, there needs to be a functioning government, there needs to be uh, banks and financial institutions. So you look at it, from the perspective of a, of a system that you need uh, to support it. So this is not the only factor to contribute here. And for example, I was involved in a project on the cadaster. You know, cadaster where you basically you set the land rights. And it's a long journey and it's a big project, you know. People are working on this. They're working on agricultural finance projects. And it's not a straight line, it's a bit of a slippery road. And so there are many organizations, projects, but also the government itself, of course, trying to work towards these targets and working, basically working on that. And then we are there, and our, our efforts are not also not a straight line, but we intersect here. And maybe here we intersect because we found out this farmer is not using a, like organic manure because he doesn't own the land. So you try, you have an intersection here, right? You continue, maybe overcome that bottleneck and you get a, a problem here. There's no finance for people to take, for example, the yields out from this person, maybe not directly related to the fertilizer. 
and you have an intersection here. And this can be a bottleneck, but it can also help your project forward because if you team up with these guys and say, look, we are part of your system to achieve this, you can, might even go faster, right? So I hope this spaghetti is a little bit uh, clear. I think uh, I've not worked with the com communication department. Uh, not on that. <laughs> yeah, you saw the one with, yeah, okay. All right. Um, so the question is actually, is the devil in the detail or is it in the context, right? And I think in the, in the scaling, we really have to look at the context in which we are, are working. There, the, the devil is more in the context than in the detail, right? So what would be the finding from this first part? There's a second part coming, right? So don't, uh, uh, don't get too excited. Um, scaling is more than large adoption, right? It's increasingly becoming more important to talk about system change and about sustainability. And a successful pilot project is no guarantee for a success at scale, okay? It requires very different skills, approaches, ways of collaboration, and actually, it's much more complex than uh, the project that we are doing. It's much more complex. And it's a process that should be planned and managed to a certain extent. But what is clear, it doesn't happen spontaneously. People also say a project plus hope is scaling. I don't think this is, uh, you see, this is how people look at it. It doesn't happen spontaneously. And I'm also not saying like projects are bad, etc. We need projects, but they should be designed already from the beginning as a piece of the puzzle to that overarching problem that you're trying to reach. And if you have that overarching problem in, in, in sight, then you can see actually who else is contributing to this and, and where do you intersect with them? Because one day you will have a, a blockage because of that. You're not in the greenhouse. So what do you see worldwide? You see a, a trend away from pilot projects or project thinking to system change. Donors are integrated scaling in the strategy. IFAT has gone a very long way in basically saying, okay, whatever project comes out from, from, from us, it needs to have these kind of criteria that are important for scaling. GIZ is working hard on it. They have in the method area, they have now a uh, se section. USAID is very strongly focusing on this now, especially in the feed the future. IDRC has also a very nice vision, very much towards responsible scaling, which I'll come back to later. But donors are also putting scaling as a conditionality for funding. We had a, a money from ACIR only if it's about scaling. GIZBF, we submitted last week, only if it's about scaling and system change. The Netherlands, they're also going in a direction to say, okay, we want system change. If you need a project to do it, fine, but explain how we're gonna do that system change. Agricultural research institutes, our brothers and sisters, are institutionalizing scaling. IITA split up in, in partnerships for development and research. Area is restructuring. ECP has a, a scaling unit or a trans, transfer of technology unit. People are adding scaling experts to their teams. I met a few uh, also in Nairobi and others. And GIZ is even expanding the, the support for scaling people in uh, the CGIR and the demand is, is there. The communities of practice, etc. Okay. So that, that was basically the first part to talk a little bit about the scaling mindset, what scaling is. Now the second part is about CIMIT and scaling. And I, I walk by here every day because the coffee machine is in Bruno's uh, room. So I, I have to, maybe, maybe it's on purpose actually. Yeah? And the first sentence, uh, maybe, yeah, you just maybe read it yourself. Um, so what, how are we approaching scaling here at, at, uh, at CIMIT or we're trying to do that? It's, it's simple. Why simple? Because we are not the scalers. We are working through the others. So we need to be able to communicate clearly what we want to do. So we say successful adoption of any technological innovation depends actually on the non-technological -technolog factors. This is the same with my telephone. If there's no uh, charger there, I will only use it for 24 hours. If I'm not able to charge it with um, credit, I will also not be able to use it. I don't even want to use it. If I don't have any friends, I also <laughs> not use it, right? So, and the thing is that these non-technological innovations also need to scale. 
So we're saying we're going to scale this technology, but you need to scale and increase the adoption of the other elements as well to create this enabling environment, right? And Larry Cooley, the person who's coming in uh, next week or two weeks, he said this can even be 10% technology, 90% non-technological. And IITA, Mark Schutt, is giving a very nice example, which I like very much. He say like the electric car, right? Okay, maybe you need to uh, have a better battery for it to be adopted. But there are people working on making charging stations, calculating how far they should be from each other, how to make sure that they function. How do you market this? You know, need, people need incentives to do it. In, in Peking, Beijing, you cannot buy a car. It takes you six months. If you buy an electric car, you can get it in a month, right? Policy innovation, subsidies, etc. All these kind of innovations are necessary to make this one accepted by, by the, the population, basically. And these are teams which may be bigger than the people that work on the technology. They're working on this kind of things every day to make it happen. Now, we try to, this concept, this idea, we, we try to put it into a tool so that we make it useful for, for the people that we are working with. And we call it uh, the scaling scan. And it's a collaboration between CIMIT and PPP Lab, which is basically led by SNV in the Netherlands. And I, will, I think we need a, net, a separate session to talk about what the tool is, et cetera. But you can download already a version here. It's a draft. We're going to upload it uh, actually in three weeks. And what it basically does, it promotes you to, to have this scaling mindset, according to this theory I will show you later. And it helps you to analyze and sharpen a scaling approach that you have. So it basically is built on 10 scaling ingredients. We say, if you want to scale something, these all 10 things need to be in order or need to scale as well, let's put it this way. So you have a technology, but there needs to be a business case around it. People need to be aware of the technology. And within all of these, oh, the microphone works much better here. Uh, within all of these, we try to capture the lessons learned. For example, in technology, it's pretty clear. We know, you know, we need to be easy to adopt. It needs to uh, have a comparative advantage. I think there's a lot of literature also from CIMIT about this. But what do we know about functioning value chains? So we looked into literature on how do value chains work? What are, how do they scale and how do they not scale? What about finance? So we looked into the literature on finance, agricultural finance. What are key factors that need to be in order for it to function and to be able to to push other things to, to work. So those kind of things, I put, um, I made a small handout here, and you can also email me if you want them. It just gives you the, the key points for each of these ingredients, um, yeah, what you need basically to scale. So if you walk out, I only printed 10 copies to save the environment, uh, but you can get an email. If you want, you can write me an email. So this is about that. Now I want to give you some examples of, of what Simit is already doing in terms of scaling. And uh, just give you some examples. I'm also here I want to say, I've only been here a year and I've only worked with some people intensively and maybe there are many other fantastic things going on that I'm not aware of. So please don't feel uh, left out or something. Um, maybe you want to be left out also. So this is one example, which is a bit of a complex example, but I think it, it describes very nicely what we're actually trying to do. So this is a project, um, SRFSI project, uh, financed by the Australians. And they gave us an extension of the project until 2019. This is the time. However, the, the target of the project is going to be measured in 2021. They say we want one and a half million people to adopt conservation, agricultural, sustainable intensification, right? So this is the target, right? But we have actually no project activities here. You don't hear me? Better? 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 Yeah. OK. So we have no project activities um, uh, here. So basically what the Australians ask from us, they say, look, you stop in 2019, but we want to be confident that the arrow is not going this direction, but is going this direction. So they're talking, the, the discussion goes now away from one and a half million, how do you count this, etc. to how do we make sure that we and they are confident enough that the arrow doesn't go here, but that it goes there, okay? 
In other words, I talked about this tipping point. So before we pack our bags and leave the project, we want to have reached that tipping point after which the scaling will go without our interference and we're out into the real world, right? So this is the real world and here we are still in the, in the project. Let me see if I... Let's see. Another project, another... This is not working, huh? Yeah? Okay. Um, the CISA project, USAID and Servicey, same in the same region, working together uh, to basically influence the policy makers that are setting the subsidies. In, in, in India and in Nepal, a lot depends on the subsidies. There's hardly any free market. It's very much focused on subsidies, if you get the subsidy for a machine. But they're sometimes uh, um, focusing on, for us, the wrong machines, maybe that are destroying the soil, etc. So we are organizing workshops with them to try to, to make sure that they also subsidize the kind of innovations that we are promoting. So in that sense, if our project is $1 million, they are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that they can leverage to push in that direction. So in that sense, we're basically multiplying whatever we're doing through others um, and, and trying to reach the impact like this, right? What they're also doing, I think this is Bangladesh, they're doing third-party monitoring. They're not monitoring only what they're doing themselves and the number of farmers they're reaching, but they're basically monitoring whatever the private sector in that area is investing in this technology that we are promoting. So this is a graph of, I think, three or four um, dealers and saying, how much did you sell? Independent of the project. This has nothing, to, this is independent of the project, but basically they are convinced of what we're promoting, and I think this is a very convincing uh, case for people to say, well, if the people are doing it from themselves, out of their own initiative, it's probably good, right? And we want to collaborate with you. So these kind of things, not only monitoring what happens in your project, but monitoring what, you, what is happening in the environment, I think is a very nice example of, of, of this scaling mindset. Another one, Simlesa and Eastern uh, and Southern Africa, they developed a, a scaling fund where they basically said, okay, whoever has a good idea to get whatever we have out to the market, write us. And then there was Shamba Shape Up. You should really check the website. It's very funny. They're having like a, a documentary, kind of like a funny way of talking about agriculture. And they made episodes about the kind of things that, that, uh, that Simlesa is doing. So, and they're reaching like one million people, right? People are watching TV and they see suddenly, okay, what is a reaper, what is this? Collaboration DTMS is a very good example because Kate Fehlenberg is working there, which is a real good and strong scaler. Uh, she worked for USAID before, and she's using stakeholder mapping tools to diversify from research partners to more like scaling partners. Of course, this was a project very much focused on research, and then they said, okay, let's scale, but we had the same kind of partners that were doing the scaling. And of course, that doesn't work, right? So they said, okay, what kind of capacities do we need? And we put it in a table. And who are the players in the country that we work with? And who are the top players? We don't want to build capacity to scale. We want to work with those guys that know how to do it. Because we, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, right? So that's one example. They're also working, for example, on consultants on behavior change, right? Something that also doesn't happen in many of our projects, but just di different kind of expertise. Similar thing also in Mazagra Guanajuato, also working with uh, network analysis and trying not to be the spider in the web, but maybe on the periphery where you help others basically making those linkages. And there actually the demand came from the hub manager, Eric uh, what's his, Ortiz himself. He said, I want my technicos to operate as brokers. I don't want to be, in, to be the, the slave of the, or the, the personal assistant of the farmer, you know? So we went there last week strengthening the scaling mindset, developing scaling strategy, but also linking up. There's a lot of information available within Mazagro. This is, has been there for a while. But now in the scaling mindset, they have to use this kind of thing. So we try to also to make use of the information that we already have um, to strengthen their cases, right? Now, if you look at all these examples and um, 
also as, at Simit as a whole. And now I'm going a little bit into the, to the swampy area. So <laughs> if I run off, then uh, just, uh, you know, don't take it personal. Um, I think what the specific challenges <laughs> for Simit are that we are in small scale agriculture and there's a high heterogeneity of what we're doing. So we need to have local solutions. It's different than, for example, McDonald's. I think the McDonald's in Texcoco looks exactly the same as the one in Netherlands, for example, right? Uh, and this is not possible for what the kind of work that we're doing. We're also working in, in developing countries. We're scaling deep, like this behavior change is a very important element as well. And what we find, and what, what we knew already, but what we also really find in the cases that we do uh, when we use the tool, technology is hardly ever the limiting factor in these environments that we are in. We always need some kind of package of technologies with soft components, etc. But of course, all these components need to scale. So it's much more difficult than trying to sell a vacuum cleaner in Belgium, for example, right? And then you get into the discussion. Do you want uh, to have many people, people benefit a little bit? Or do you want a few people to benefit a lot, right? So you get into this public good and who's going to benefit from this project discussion, which can sometimes block many things. Another three things. What is very important, I think, we are also mandated to scale responsibly. So we are not just like Microsoft trying to sell as much as possible. We are also saying, okay, we are Simit, we want to help people get out of poverty, etc. But we also don't want to destroy the environment. So if we cannot just put fertilizer everywhere, right? There's limits to what we're doing. And we, what we're, whatever we're doing, we always have to keep checks and balances of what the effect is on the environment. So for us, we, we put this on ourselves, but I think it's the right thing to do. Then we have the big discussion, research versus development, which also comes in here, of course. And you have the culture of CIMIT and also the institutional setup of CIMIT, which also plays a role in our ability to basically take up that role as a, as a scale a broker, broker for scale, or whatever we want to be. Maybe on this part on scaling development, and again, this is a bit experimental, right? I think we are not necessarily, scaling is not necessarily the development that we need to do, right? I think what we should do in designing for scale, a project we should design them for scale, and already at the beginning, we should make sure or anticipate how the development should look like. So we don't just design a project from to get the innovation out or the technology out, but we should, in the design of our project, we should already think how is it going to be scaled, and if Mr. X or Company Y is going to be a key player, get them on board already during the innovation process. Right? So we need to design for scale, get things in very early on. Connectivity trumps control. I think uh, we cannot keep controlling uh, the way that we've been doing, we need to connect and we need to build capacity to scale. Like we, we are working through others, so they must basically be able to do that. And scaling is an art, but it's also a science. And I want to show this here, the science of scaling. Well, what we want to do, we want to have a scaling ambition. What actually would we want to scale? Where do we want to scale? For whom? With whom? Uh, when? So there's all questions that you get into before you can start analyzing. Okay, how is it doing in terms of finance? How is the situation concerning leadership? How is the situation concerning knowledge and skills? But if you look at what we're already doing, foresight, there. <laughs> Targeting typology, Santiago, uh, he's not here. There's a lot of work already going on. For example, this network uh, analysis. We could use it in that scaling ambition in, in Guanajuato. A lot of it's already science is already happening there. And of course, in the technology, we want to discover, do the proof of concept, do the piloting of scalable technologies. This is a big chunk of work that CIMIT is doing. Here we have this network analysis. We're working in innovation systems in terms of awareness and demand, looking at behaviors, uh, monitoring and learning, process monitoring, not only looking at do we reach the output, but really what has been the process to reach that. And also the capacity to use and to scale whatever solution we have. Now, this is maybe the most experimental one. So also the CIMIT culture, we are in a culture of, of very high control, right? Scientists are also, I think, 
uh, learn to be in control of the situation and do the things how they should be done, right? So this is a happy scientist. Maybe you've seen one today or maybe last week. This is a happy scientist, okay? So bear with me here. Eh? This is very... And what, uh, what you see, people are getting unhappy because they're saying, well, we need to do also look at the agricultural finance component. There's a governance component. There's a value chain component. They also ask me to reach so many people. So they feel like they, you know, they're being stretched out, right? But the, se the second thing is agricultural finance, agricultural value change, agricultural policy. Many of the colleagues think because the work agriculture is in there, I can do it. I work in agriculture, right? Instead of another model which would say, look, I'm here. I give full responsibility to this kind of group of people. And even I allow them to, de to make this link, make, let this guy make this link. I don't need to be in the spider web, right? So really defining your roles and responsibilities and also respecting that there are experts in other areas that can also do a very good job and link up to them. Now, some people are happy with this and they can do it and I think that's fine. But I think a lot of people feel a bit like uh, schizophrenia maybe. That we have to do science, but we also have to do development. You get into this discussion, uh, discussion, right? So this this culture, I think, is there. And another thing is, I think that um, people are very much in high control. It also makes them very, uh, uh, you know, focus on what they are doing, right? Collaboration. I think compared to my previous jobs, I have seen it is that people are not collaborating a lot. I think so. I'm here if I'm running away now. But I think this is also a, a, a problem at, uh, at CIMIT, right? Now maybe, that's maybe human nature and you know, all these kind of things. But there's also an institutional setup issue, I think. If you look at the KPIs, people are still very much rewarded on peer-reviewed publications, right? What about promotion of, of teamwork? What about promotion of impacts? What, about, what are the priorities here, right? So people are also feel torn. They, they are torn not because of how, who they are, but I think also because of the system that we are in, right? Another thing is also if, if you really want to, to, to scale uh, and work on scaling and say, okay, we're going to reach this 100 million uh, farmers, you also have to network with other experts. You need to have a network, first of all, of other experts in finance, in, in, in uh, lobbying, advocacy, in other areas. And, and be able to attract them and keep them here as well. I think there are a few good examples, but I think we could do more in that respect to really be prepared for, I mean, I think the big change or the big wave of asking for scaling and system change that, that's going to happen. So my take home messages are, uh, scaling is more about the system change and sustainability than reaching large numbers. I think this is a, a change which we already see, uh, but so far people have focused a lot on the numbers, right? But the numbers are there to reach the system change. I think we need a scaling mindset, and with that scaling mindset we can use many, many of the tools I think that we, that we already have, but we look at it a little bit differently. Theory of change and all these things I think are excellent tools to develop strategies, etc. But maybe you look at it a little bit differently when you have the scaling mindset. And CIMIT has really great examples of working on scaling, but I think it's not yet intrinsic. I think there are projects that are doing a lot. There are some people that are doing a, a little bit. Some projects are only doing a, a, a certain element of it, maybe uh, very strong on the monitoring, but basically doing nothing on collaboration. And I think also that is because we have also these very bilateral focused projects where people are working in their own project and maybe not communicating with them, so I, I really see this one CIMIT idea as, as a critical thing. And I, yeah, I really think it's very, really good. And I think one day we can go here where it's really an intrinsic part of what CIMIT is doing, that scaling is basically part of what we're doing, or system change, or however you want to, to work with it. So another thing I think which is important to, for you to, to know is that we're using and developing tools to help design and implement projects uh, through a scaling lens. So we're already working with it. I'm working with on something. We're working with Carolina and Maria. With Maria and then Kate is working on tools and other people are also using tools to get this scaling mindset uh, in. So I think this was it. Yes. So thank you very much.
Now the embarrassing detail comes. No, no, no. <laughs> I really enjoy your presentation, Leonard. And I think we have to remember that CIMIT started with scaling. Think about the Green Revolution. Probably the exercise was much easier at that time, not to lower Norman Bollock's work, but <coughs> it's probably much more complex and more challenging now, and maybe with lower, uh, lower number of uh, low hanging foods. Uh, you have realized also that Leonard is an artist. He has some uh, old painting for sale. What's the price now? <laughs> <laughs> that was it, okay. <laughs> so we'll open it uh, for question. I have one comment. We are working a lot with impact pathway. That's, that's a term you never use in your presentation. Why? Um, that's a good question. You should have given to me beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, we could have used it as well, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't see a reason why not to, to talk about it. I think a lot of the things that we are doing and that we're, we're talking about are not different from the term scaling, but I think scaling puts it a little bit more in perspective and, and gets that system change in. So I think impact pathways are totally fine to talk about it, to keep talking about it. But I think with that scaling mindset in, there, in, in, in your head, I think you look at it a little bit broader, I think. Yeah. Good. Please use the mic when you have questions. Yes, Mike. Use the mic, Mike. Thanks, thanks, Leonard. That was very interesting and uh, educational. Um, I would just say to pro help promote the scaling mindset, it would be good if that presentation and other things were available on Inside Summit, and maybe it would be a good practice for us when we have internal brown bags to include in the announcement a link to the actual presentation beforehand, you know, and the announcement that goes out. That's my comment, and thank you very much. And uh, you asked me the question I was going to ask about, about impact pathway, so that's yeah. cool. Yeah. I will answer for Leonard. He just sent me the presentation 30 minutes before this seminar, and it was. <laughs> I don't maybe Isabel, you, is it available? Uh, yeah, it will be available on the Inside Meet under the brown bag sections. Uh, all, these, all the seminars are being recorded and for future reference, so they are already available. And that, for example, there's also a link to this tool. Uh, I suggest also have a look at it. It's a nice website, and uh, yeah. Olaf? Yeah, yeah thanks for your uh, presentation. It was, uh, was very useful. In terms of terminology, I mean, there's all kind of concepts, yeah? So impact pathway, theory of change, whatever. You can all put a scaling lens on that. It, it's all kind of the similar thinking. Yeah. It's just uh, the labels that differ. But uh, one, one area that I really would like to see CIMIT do more of is scaling science, yeah? and, and you touched on it. So it's not purely that division between research and development, development being the scaling, but there's a whole scaling science area that we have been underinvested. And so with your presence and, and others, I think it's an area we do want to explore further. Thanks. You never answer. Oh, it was a comment. It was a comment, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> I would fully support that. Uh, but uh, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, good that there's so many people here because we keep on talking about it. Indeed, we are an example organization of scaling. Uh, I've seen all the examples in the field, right? And it's really terrific what's going on in Africa and Asia and here in Mexico as well. But we have these huge organizations as a World Bank, African Development Bank, with pro programs in some countries of 200, 300 million to scale up agricultural innovation. Now, we don't have the strongest links there yet. Now, the, the philosophies that you present here on scaling, so the science of scaling and the, the ideas about it, do, does it fit with what those banks are doing, those big development organizations? And can we also develop our theories a little bit better that we can link up with them? Because they need the information. I've seen ex examples of programs where they had 200 million in Ethiopia, and at that time, they didn't know what to do with it in that sense. Yeah. So by having more scaling expertise, can we link better in that sense? Yeah, I think, I think there's a big demand for that kind of knowledge. I think even just the first question, what should you scale, how and, and where, I think the, what, what, what Santiago is doing on this really this targeting and these recommendation domains, people are slowly realizing, okay, there is science in that and we need to know the answers on that. A lot is going on in, in, in monitoring because people know that if you monitor well, you can get buy-in from other stakeholders, which is key for, for scaling. So there are a lot of innovations going on, and I think CIMIT is also doing a lot. Uh, but maybe the others are maybe even a bit further there. I think especially in this beginning, what to scale, where to scale, and uh, yeah, and people do need also technologies that are scalable. Often 
you find out that what you're doing is actually shouldn't be scaled. So I think there's a, there's a real space for us to come in, not as the, as the hub, but part of the, of the network. Mike again. Mike again. Um, you, you mentioned something about the difference between a broker for change and a slave to farmers. Could you uh, explain that a little bit, what an extension agent's or a person's role should be, like ideally, as opposed to what it shouldn't be? In those situations, uh, actually, I you know I said I said I always have one joker up my sleeve. I could also answer, but I think it would. Be, can you answer, Carolina, that one because it's we talked about it a lot this week. I'm not avoiding the question, but I think it's. I mean, there's a lot of knowledge here. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, in the in the literature about change agents, there have been different terms for referring to them. So in the traditional linear model of technology transfer, the term that was used was extensionist. So it was the person that was interacting with the researcher who was already, already having the solution and bringing it to the farmer who was only a receptor of the, of the solution. So when the participatory approaches arrived in the 80s, 90s, they start talking that the, this, this change agent should change to facilitate learning processes. So they start talking about facilitators, no? And in the 2000s, to this decade that uh, agricultural innovation systems are very strong, what they are talking about is about these brokers, systemic brokers, that what they try to do is to link different actors from the value chain. So in some way or another, uh, in that process of changing of these agents, Let's say that when Leonard is referring to the experience of Masagra Guanajuato, what is happening is that uh, the, um, the region is, is getting more projects. And what is happening is that the hub manager needs um, some people who, have, um, who help him brokering in the field in the specific region. So let's say that he's brokering at state level, but each of the, of the technicals that are in the field and that beforehand they were going and visit a farmer and, and talking with the farmer for improving the way the practices. Now he's needing also because of the complexity of projects to become brokers in their own regions, connecting with local authorities, connecting with schools and all that. So, so in that sense, Lena is, is, is referring to that. And for us, it's a kind of experiment because we are, well, there are 24 ex um, technicals there. Yeah. We don't think that all of them are in that line of wanting yeah. to move that, but some of them perhaps they can see their role moving because even in the case of uh, hub managers, they have been having this movement from being very technical that they were with a farmer to becoming brokers in their, in their hubs. Yeah, I, I think the part of that was a frustration among the people as well, that they're basically working with 15 farmers, and then the farmers say, ah, I need seed, can you get it for me? And they drive to the town and do all this kind of work for them. And saying, okay, there's such huge problems here, why can't we take a different role? And this is not fit for everybody. Not all the technicals can be done, but there are some guys that probably, or ladies, that can also do that. Good. Marianne? Yeah. Uh, Leonard, very nice, spot-on presentation, really enjoyed it. Um, just one comment, I mean, you then linked it back to one summit. I mean, for, I would rather link it to our partnership concept, and that is because I don't see us having all the expertise in-house. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really, the question is whether we have the right kind of partnerships. Yeah. I mean, CIMIT invests about one-third of our resources go are invested in partners, and I think what this presentation is to really say, I mean, what I don't support is, is the is the view like we can solve everything in-house. Yeah. Uh, exactly. If we just put seeds together with the best agronomy, with the best yeah. socioeconomic, we yeah. solve the world's problem in-house. Sorry, no. It is, CIMIT is a research organization yeah. focused on certain areas of expertise. And the issue to really get scaling as well part of our research is to link with the right partner exactly. organization. So in that regard, I mean, particularly this nice uh, circle of essentially what expertise, I think it's a very nice checklist as where we had maybe the greenhouse duplication view of scaling into yeah. do we have the right partnerships 
uh, that we link in through our collaborative activities. Yeah, I, I think I think maybe I, I didn't um, explain that correctly, but I also think that I think I think what is missing that we don't realize what is missing. We keep thinking agriculture is the is the solution to that problem, but. I think we should work much more with, with really marketing people. We're doing a sort of marketing, but we're not doing it in the professional way. We should work with media companies to bring awareness, but people that really know how people think and, and tick, you know. So I, I, I think we should work with those kind of uh, people. Doesn't have to, they don't have to work for Simit. Yeah, so maybe, yeah, okay, I, I see now. Okay, I don't want to say that. But uh, we should know what we're missing and also be honest about it and not be pulling and say, well, I'll also do something on agricultural finance or I'll also do something here. And I think, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd like to, I, I agree with, with what, what Marianne said. Um, and in order to do that, to build those kind of partnerships, uh, you do need to have the awareness uh, amongst the the, the, the CIMIT staff about uh, about wh wh what is at stake. Yeah. But the danger is, and that's what you also alluded to in your presentation, uh, is that uh, if, uh, if someone picks up a little bit uh, a part and aware of that something is happening, that then says, okay, well, I can do it myself. I don't need the, these kind of partnerships. But you need to, you need to have that, that basic knowledge of what is going on without being able to actually do it yourself in order to be able to communicate with yeah. those who can. Yeah. 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 For example, in Guanajuato last week, the recommendation was try to find out if there's a, a, a workshop on agricultural finance and just go there, meet people, get into that network and see that they're having the same problems as you have. They don't talk that different language. But I think we, we keep too much to... So there are very good examples. Eh? NSAF, they're working with designers and, and like I said, DTMS with people on behavior change. But I think we can do much more than that. We should do much more than that, but yes. We need to understand that there are people that are professionals in this and that we can work with them. Isabel, there is a question online, I think. No? Yes. Yeah, I yes. see. I saw. Okay. How do you know that? There is a comment from Eric, a good learner. Te vemos acá en Guanajuato la próxima semana. Yes. And there is there are two questions from Tania Casaya. Uh, from your perspective, in Latin America, who of the stakeholders actors are more comfortable with the concept of scaling? And the next one, who we need to persuade more in the mind change? with this concept to facilitate the process? Maybe it's um, who was uh, first, the egg or the chicken question? <laughs> That's a good question, yeah. So, Eric, thank you very much. See you on Tuesday. Um, and um, uh, Tanya, um, the, qu the first question was, oh, sorry, now you, you gave your laptop away. Uh, but who, um, I, I don't know the Latin America situation very well, I, I, so I would be, difficult to say, but I think um, there are different interpretations of scaling. I think here in what the work that we're involved in, it is also very focused on only some elements of what, what, scale, what makes scaling basically. And I think we should lo really look at the 10 ingredients and not only at two or three or only at the numeric and say, okay, well, we have this quantity and this is it, you know, there's much more to it. Um, the chicken and the egg, yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no answer for that. I, we need to discuss it maybe in person. Yes. Okay, I think it's almost time to go back to our offices. Uh, I think it was very interesting and there will be likely uh, a, a workshop on scaling during Science Week because I think there are a lot of experience within CIMIT in other regions as well. Something I want to say as well, I think it's very useful to have Leonard uh, and sponsored by, by GRZ, but also thinking, having the time to think deeply about the science of scaling, the scaling in general in our project, because it will make better designed projects, more attractive projects, probably project with a clear exit strategy. Don't ask uh, asking that as well. What Leonard said, you know, we don't want to, to know what will be your exact fear in terms of impact after you know, the end of the project because it can deflate. We want to be sure that 
you are wrong in terms of adoption is going up after the project or going down and not going down. That's the exit strategy that we need to design better in projects. Leonard has been instrumental in designing already contributing to few projects in CIMIT and I think also something if you want to have a review from his eyes on, on the scaling component of your project, I think to the limit of your time availability, I guess you, you, would, you would do it uh, Huh? For free. For free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wanted to change. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. And I think we'll have probably have, uh, another exciting session during Science Week on, on, on scaling. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Good. Well done. Yes, yes.